and we should have red light. Yeah. So, uh, just before we jump in, guys, I, I have to uh, sort of pre-apologize. Uh, I didn't plan our interview very well, uh, Mateus. Uh, I have workmen in our apartment complex right outside the wall of my little office space here. And I also have a crotchety Sharpe who at some point might decide that he needs to guard our apartment from those evil workmen doing renovations <laughs> in our apartment. So you might hear a grumbly old Sharpe speak up and announce his presence here during our hangout. But everyone, welcome. Uh, my name is Juan Carlos Bagnell. I'm the senior editor of YourTechReport.com, gadget news and reviews for the rest of us. And I am joined today by Mateus Brecker of Toast in Portland, a uh, company that I had the pleasure of meeting on the CTIA show floor this year, and I was really taken with uh, the vibe of the company and the products that this company is putting out. So I'm very appreciative to have Mateus here to chat about some really cool products that I hope you guys will go and check out. Uh, Mateus, introduce yourself. Hi, nice to talk to you again, Juan. Um, I'm Mateus Brecker. I'm the founder and owner of Toasting. Um, and we can get into what we do. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and I, I think we have, let's let's go ahead and jump into what you do. I uh, when I was on the CTI show floor, uh, this show floor year felt a little a little dry. There weren't a number yeah. of really exciting or super cool announcements, which is why I was so happy that I found your company. We were walking the show floor looking for cool accessories to talk about, and uh, we stumbled on your booth on the floor, and uh, you make a really high quality natural. Uh, covers, I guess we would call them. They're not really cases, right? But they're yeah. these these covers for smartphones and tablets. And uh, why, don't, why don't you tell us a little bit more about uh, where the idea came to be doing sort of natural wood and natural leather mm -hmm. uh, products like this? Sure, sure. So I'm a product designer by trade, um, and I got my first iPhone and really couldn't find anything I wanted to put on it. Sort of typical story, I think. Um, but Atypically, I had a buddy with a laser, so um, I borrowed <laughs> some time on a friend's laser cutter and made a couple covers just for myself, and then I'd always been playing around with throwing something up on Kickstarter, and I um, and, uh, figured, well, why not? We'll try this one. You know, if it sticks, it sticks. Otherwise, I'll just go on to the next idea. So um, put it up on Kickstarter. We were able to raise money to buy a laser cutter, and... Um, the rest is history now. We just uh, and we've been <laughs> growing since then, and so actually it was our first time at CTIA. Um, we had done CES earlier in the year, and then some fashion shows the year before. But um, I launched the business um, the end of 2011. Kickstarter finished January 2012, so we've been in business a year and a half now. Um, so, so explain to me what was what was so necessary about the laser? Why why right. was the laser something that made this product happen? Sure, yeah. So I, I did a lot of custom furniture as well as product design, and I've always had a real love for natural materials, things that age gracefully, um, and just a love for wood and working with it and, and just sort of the qualities of it. And so I really love that. I thought that contrast would be amazing of a natural material with this iPhone, which is, you know, metal and glass and is super glossy and it, you know, it's kind of the ultimate industrial product, um, but it's also very impersonal because it's this, <laughs> this industrial product, right? It's, right. there's 150 million of them and they're all identical, yet we, we share our most intimate things with these objects. And it sort of felt like, well, we have this personal relationship with the screen, this you know, this kind of interesting relationship, but the, the body of it is sort of impersonal. And I think people are really looking for ways to kind of make them their own, you know, by putting a, you know, everybody has to find a different case to put it on put on there because that's what they can control. That's what they can change. Right. I, I always think it's interesting when we talk about how beautiful Apple products are because mm -hmm. it seems like no one leaves an Apple store without getting something to cover it. You know? Right. Well, like, that's kind of the danger. You get this super glossy <laughs> thing, but it doesn't age well. You know, the first scratch on there, everybody yes. should hear, right? You know, the first time you drop it in the corner. or, um, And so what I found so interesting, I thought that was, might be the perfect marrying of, like, uh, this industrial thing that looks great glossy but doesn't age with a natural material that actually ages really elegantly and gets a patina over time. Um, so I just wanted to kind of warm it up. I felt it was kind of a cold object. 
Um, and so that's kind of where I just kind of brought my woodworking and my industrial design kind of together. And um, the reason laser cutting and stuff, rather than just like carving these things on a bandsaw or something, um, is that, you know, I was interested, I mean, you know, I work in mass manufacture, and so to me, being able to mass produce, but kind of um, to keep costs low, but also use hand finishing and sort of old school techniques that guarantee that the finish is beautiful and it's kind of a hand rub finish that ages and um, is really durable versus kind of an industrial finish, which is like a spray on high gloss kind of right. thing, which actually then shows a lot of scratches easily. So I was kind of, you know, interested in marrying that kind of new technology, laser cutting, and kind of uh, very flexible manufacturing with some old school techniques of hand, you know, sanding and rubbing and, you know. Uh, now, now with, um, because we've been talking about, I mean, and, and obviously I think for a lot of companies, especially startups, that the initial push, it, it sort of makes sense that you look at Apple products just because of the consistency of design. But mm -hmm. is the, this laser manufacturing process, have you found that it's, it's been easier to stray into some of the more, I mean, obviously you don't make cases for every single Android device that's ever hit the market, but has it been easier to push into some of those other avenues because of the way that you're producing these types of products? Definitely. I mean, the nice thing about, own, you know, controlling our manufacturing, doing everything in-house, and having a very flexible manufacturing tool is we can respond really quickly to things. Um, so we're trying to introduce new products constantly. So we just we did the, we had the S4 at, at CTIA. We launched the Note 2 last week. Um, we're always kind of modifying, improving our products, um, and looking at what is the next one to do. We have I don't know three or four Android phones that we cover, um, and you know if we can get our hands on one and if it's an appropriate shape, then we can you know pretty rapidly within a week or two create a product for it, um, which. Compared to like m typical mass manufacturing, where it spends you know months in engineering and then gets you know cadding and tooling and um, and then you know early prototypes and tools get modified and you know it's just a, this massive process and then it takes you know three weeks on a boat from China and you know so our time to market is much quicker. Actually, the biggest hang up is usually packaging, which takes two to three weeks to get made locally. Um, <laughs> So, so, you know, so the, the case, the case for the case, takes yeah, exactly. more time. Than the case. Well, we do a very simple packaging. We we use a local company that that die cuts paper and foil prints it and prints it locally. But you know, getting those dies made, you know, they're they're made right here locally. But it takes a week or two, and so it's actually the yeah the product development can be quicker than the packaging, which is interesting. But um. That flexibility oh, is really exciting. So people constantly contact us and say, "Hey, what about this phone? What about this phone?" You know, and if it's an appropriate thing, yeah, we'll we'll take a look at it. And um, you know, some people actually come by and bring their phone over and be like, "Hey, you know, do one for this phone." And like the Nexus Four, somebody just like I desperately want one for the Nexus Four. And they lived in town, so I was like, "Hey, bring it over. Let me have it for a day. You know, tomorrow we'll have a product for you." So. All right, we're, we're going to hold off for just a second because my Sharpe is... Like I said, he's protecting the, uh, the apartment. Give me one second. No problem. I know, I'm mad too. Uh, yeah, just hold on one second, guys. I'll warn everybody that we may have a disruption on our end if um, the next door neighbors who have... Uh, Guitar pedal companies start testing their stuff. It gets pretty loud in here. <laughs> uh, best interview ever. <laughs> oh, come on, bigger. So uh, the other thing that I wanted to talk about, because you had already sort of mentioned the uh, the in-house nature of a lot of a lot of what you guys are doing. Mm -hmm. um, is uh, that all of these products are made in the United States, actually in Portland. Yes. Yeah. The, the, the product, the packaging, um, the, the hardwoods come out of mostly out of Pennsylvania, North American hardwoods. 
And then bamboo um, is a grass, but it's mainly grown in Asia, so it's considered very sustainable. So we have a very strong environmental background of the company. So we donate 1% of our profits to nonprofits working for, uh, for the environment. Um, so this year we've supported um, Native Fish Society and we're working to restore streams and native fish populations. So, you know, we try and do, do good. Um, figured it was easy to set that up before we made any money and the company grew. And hopefully, you know, and make that something that's really inherent in the, our company from day one. So, you know, people like that made in America story of environment, um, environmental consciousness um, of a company. And so I think that helps sell product, honestly. You know, people want to feel good about what they buy. Um, helps in the story. Um, and, you know, makes me feel good about what we're doing. Well, and, and, and the joke that you guys were telling on the CTIA show floor was that you guys were really like the show Portlandia. So, like, you really cared about this kind of stuff, but to maybe an extreme sort of way. Or right. Way. Yeah, I mean, Portland is a fun show. You know, it's um, it takes things a little too far, of course. It's a bizarro land, but, um, you know, it always starts out with a, a kernel of truth about Portland. And, and you know, we Portland is a funny place. You know, we all are sort of um, born-again hippies and... Uh, trying to create the lifestyle we want to live in. So, right. um, you know, and I'm not going to knock the put a bird on it because that's our number one bestseller. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, you know, we, we kind of, um, Portland's a place where people move to live a certain kind of lifestyle and, like, focus on the things that interest them. And um, so you get a lot of brew pubs and a lot of funky things going on and um, a lot of uh, entrepreneurs doing creative things, and there's a lot of small-scale manufacturing starting up here. What, what is, it, is, it, is it about the community vibe that you think is attracting people to the area, or is it something that's already sort of there that is now finding a wider audience thanks to some of these new, like, crowdfunding tools and mm -hmm. social media sharing? Well, I mean, Portland's not big enough to support all these businesses like mine that we do sell a fair amount around town. Um, you know, people move to Portland because of a certain uh, perception or lifestyle that people, you know, bring here. And, you know, probably the strongest proponents of that Portland uh, aesthetic or uh, Portland attitude are, are imports like me you know, move from the East Coast or, you know, up in California. And, um, you know, it's just, it's it's a way of life that people move here for. But I think that that a lot of that, we're exporting a lot of the ideas to, you know, the sense of, you know, place and supporting local businesses and, um, you know, some back, sort of old school manufacturing and hand tooling of leathers and, you know, um, art and sort of that, that DIY culture. Um, yeah. You know, and the, the food culture that's here where it's all about, you know, local sourcing. And I think, you know, a lot of the ideas are getting exported um, around the U.S. And, and so I think we're having a bit more influence than just, you know, our own hippie town. Right. So uh, one of the things, and I read this on the website, and I, I wanted to ask you about it, was, uh, and you sort of lightly touched on this, was the, uh, all of your energy coming from renewable sources. And mm -hmm. while you were setting up, uh, especially after, because I also want to talk to uh, um, about your Kickstarter campaign too, your Kickstarter success, is what were some of the challenges in setting that up? I mean, what kind of energy output were you looking at needing to cover to be able to power your business using renewable sources? Um, well, we don't actually use a lot of power. Um, laser cutters, you know, the laser tube is 80, 90 watts, you know, so it's not a lot of juice. The cooler for the laser is probably the most energy. Um, but, you know, our office uses the same as a typical household, you know, on a monthly basis. So we don't <laughs> use a lot of energy. Um, and, you know, the electric companies here make it really easy to sign up. You know, you sign up for wind power or um, pure renewable power. So, and we're lucky in, in Oregon to have a lot of wave, um, sorry, hydropower. So oh, fantastic. 
a lot of green power here from the big rivers and stuff. Um, so, you know, actually getting green power was kind of an easy no-brainer. Um, the thing, you know, that a lot of Portlanders, Portlanders do anyways, and so it was kind of an easy checkbox, you know, signing up for like gotcha. physical, uh, studios. So, so that's more of like a community initiative, not something that you had to... Because I, like, I, looking at how like solar power might march through the southwest, it's still sort of more the onus is on the individual to mm -hmm. set up a, a system like that or to take advantage of renewable energy like that. And so you, you had access, um, at both a, like a personal and a business sense in the community to mm -hmm. these types of power. Yeah, programs. a lot of that stuff, I mean, that's kind of what's interesting about Portland is because... You know, it's kind of attested for a lot of that green initiatives. Um, so, you know, green power, like all of the electric companies have, like, offered these green power initiatives and um, where you can do, like, salmon-friendly power or, <laughs> or, you know, um, you know, we're part of the country where people are worrying about the bird kills from, you know, wind turbines and, you know, so... I know we're in a sort of a bubble here in Portland, but um, right. I think it's a it's a test bed for a lot of green thinking and seeing how marketable it is. Like, or you know, Portland just instituted about a year ago um, compost pickup from your house, all your food waste and everything. Nice. And, um, you know, it's pretty amazing. They actually cut um, the amount of waste going to landfill by 37 percent last year. Wow, that's fantastic. I mean, that's an enormous amount. Right. I mean, so, you know, they're testing all those things here. And, and yeah, maybe it's um, maybe a little easier to convince us to do that. But um, I think it's a good test bed here. for. And so there's a lot of green stuff that's fairly easy to do. Um, I know that was something that the um, I think I just heard something on NPR recently about New York trying to get behind some of these composting and... Uh, recycling ventures just because of the extreme amount of material which is going into who knows where landfills mm -hmm. uh, that it's it's exciting to see communities like you know like Portland getting a, getting a behind initiatives like that uh, so one of the other things that I really wanted to talk to you about was um, that this uh, this company you were able to to start it uh, well, you said originally by using a friend's laser but to get your own laser mm -hmm. uh, by funding on Kickstarter and I was hoping you could speak a little bit, a uh, little bit about what some of your experiences were in using crowdfunding to get your business up off the ground. Right. Sure. Um, yeah. Well, my uh, right from the beginning, my business plan, like understanding of like if I wanted to mass manufacture these, I I couldn't do it by renting time on a laser. Um, I really needed the equipment in house, um, and so you know, um, not having deep pockets, you know. I, Kickstarter seemed like a great place to, to try it out. Um, my experience on Kickstarter was really good. You know, I, obviously it was successful, and so I, I can't complain about that. Um, we, you know, we weren't we weren't a rock star project. You know, we raised sixteen thousand dollars, which you know is a good chunk of change, but compared to you know a million and a half dollars for you know for some of these projects, a ten million dollars for a watch project, you know, right. all peanuts. Um, the interesting thing about Kickstarter, at least my experience, was that it demanded a lot of me. You know, at first I was like, oh, you know, I just shoot this video and I stick it up there and I sit back, you know, and a month later, you know, there should be money there. <laughs> right. And, and you're just, just going to make it rain. It's just gonna, Right, gonna right. And a lot of people have that perception of Kickstarter. And maybe it's gotten big enough now to do that, but I doubt it. It still requires an enormous amount of um, social networking and um, pushing all you know avenues to get attention to your project, um, and it's pretty interesting because Kickstarter will give you a breakdown of where your funding came from. So I, you know, about a third of my funding came just from my own social network. You know, my reach out to everybody I possibly knew or ever met. Um, and then a third came from the Kickstarter community, people that just organically found us. Oh, that's that's great. Um, and then a third came from really my pushing out into larger media, um, just getting reviews on blogs and things like that. Um, but it was, you know, we the campaign was a month long, and, you know, I worked 80 hours a week just to make sure I got there. 
And, um, you know, if I was, had a good paying job, I probably would have made more money in that month. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but, um, uh, it, you know, it was great. And what was so positive about it was after I completed that process, then I really already had that a, a, a foundation of social, you know, network and customers right. that I could then build upon and experience working in, you know, trying to raise uh, interest in the project and in the business. So I had that experience. It was kind of a quick, you know, boot camp. And then when I launched the business, I sort of already okay. I've I figured out or how how I approach a blog or how I talk to magazines or you know, how I push things out in my social network. So it was actually a really um, great way to kind of learn, in, you know, by doing. Um, and okay. so, yeah, I, you know, Kickstarter was great. You know, I couldn't have done this without that project, um, without that funding, so... Well, I, I think it's I think it's kind of interesting because you, you touched on one of the the sort of misconceptions of how crowdfunding is often presented. In that, you know, once it's on Kickstarter, people fund it. You know, if mm -hmm. if, if it's a if the idea has merit, it's a complete meritocracy, and that's how these projects get money and sort of in a vacuum. Um, and, yeah. And so, well, that was my perception of the whole business world, you know, product world, honestly. Like, as a product <laughs> designer, you know, I kind of was of the impression of if you build it, they will come, right? right. Or you create the great product and you just wait. You know, people will find it and people will spread the word and it will all just be organic. And you don't have to do anything. Um, and that's not how the world operates. The business <laughs> world operates. Um, so yeah, a lot of, you know, we don't hear about, you know, Kickstarter, I think it's 40 or 50 percent of the projects fail. Um, you don't, you know, if, but the only ones that stay up on there are the ones that succeed and so you kind of, if you're just trolling around, you, you just see all the success and, and you think that it must be a fairly easy thing to do. Um, it may be easy if you have a million, you know, followers on Facebook or something, but right. um, if you're just a normal Joe, uh, with a few friends, <laughs> it's a lot of work. Um, but and and just to touch on uh, what you, what you said, following the um, have you found that because of the eighty hour weeks that you were putting into Kickstarter, mm -hmm. and now uh, how long ago was your Kickstarter campaign? Um, that was about a year and a half ago. About a year and a half ago. So yeah. so for the like the two thirds of the people who backed your project that you didn't already have in your social networks, mm -hmm. are they still engaged? Or are they still acting as brand ambassadors? Are they still helping you spread the toast word right. on their networks? Um, to some extent, yes. Um, we still communicate with them a little bit. Um, we don't try and flood people with information, but we do like quarterly. At every six months, we do updates on you know what we're doing, and and we get a lot of positive feedback. You know, we made a lot of connections in the Kickstarter realm that kept going. You know, so we we you know met people around the world um, who you know are now helping distribute the product or you know have blogs and just sort of this, that that was the beginning of relationships, and then we kind of have been building with that since um, for sure. Um, and, you know, it's been really successful. It, it taught me that people really want to interact. Um, right. That, you know, those those few people that, you know, that send you a note, send you an email and, or a tweet and really kind of want to express their appreciation for a product, those are the people that you really want to make sure to keep in contact with and, and, you know, get their feedback on stuff and let them know about new things. And, um not necessarily as a really a focused way to be our ambassadors, but um, I but think that they, happens. But they seem they seem happy to to share in a positive experience because often yeah. I, I'll find a number of situations like this where the the, the major sharing seems to be about negative experiences, and that's mm. something that I, I'm sure a company would want to either avoid or find a way to solve problems for people or anything like that. I, I, actually, that yeah. that's maybe my follow up is. Have have any has anyone come to you with negative experiences following this Kickstarter campaign that you were able to work through because of this sort of social back and forth? Sure, absolutely. You know, um, you know, any business has returns, and you know, uh, customers that you know were didn't get what they expected, um, 
and you know we really focus on that customer support you know um, and making sure people sort of understand the product um, try and be as clear as possible when we're selling it but also you know to inform them afterwards or or refund their money you know just to me from the beginning you know I was very aware that you know the brand is tiny and it's you know really depends on people feeling having a good experience with it so we've always kind of a taken approach where it's sort of a no questions you know we'll make it right kind of policy um, and I think that's been good because you know probably nine out of ten times not that we get approached by <laughs> Ten uh, unhappy customers that frequently, but like you know, ninety percent of the time, you know, if it starts off, they're not, you know, most people aren't used to dealing with customer service or they're dealing with a no-name, you know, um, person, and you don't know where the customer service rep is. You know, we we try and kind of uh, really deflect um, and be very sort of apologetic and friendly right from the beginning, and most of the, you know, nine times out of ten you know, that communication, actually, that interaction changes, you know, where it goes, oh, I've got this problem, it wasn't what I expected, and then you have this, you know, brief conversation, and you're actually, like, trying to communicate with them, and um, and one, understand, you know, trying to understand what they're doing. Or, um, all of a sudden, actually, it changes from a negative situation to a positive situation, uh, often. So well, and and I know for me personally, it's it often comes down to just whether or not I feel someone's being you know, is is being respectful of my query. You know, it mm -hmm. might not even be a negative problem or a real problem or not a problem yet. It, so much as I just need someone to acknowledge that something, you know, might not be quite right, or I might be using something wrong or incorrectly. And mm -hmm. all too often, I get sort of the brush off. You know, oh well, here's an FAQ. You can go look at that. You know, like like I haven't already. You know, just right. try turning it off and on again. I'm past that step. I just need you to listen to what I'm saying. <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah. Um, you know, we get actually, you know, on most of our interactions, we always get a really nice email back saying, you know, your customer service is awesome. Um, you know, you solved my questions. And, you know, you know, if it was a default in the product, then they're, you know, they're like, uh, you know, you guys are awesome. We got a new one. It's perfect. You know, we're going to tell all our friends. So, you know, it changes what was going to be a negative interaction for these people to really a positive one. They start, they feel better even more about the company than maybe they started with. So, um, but there's, no, you know, the internet. Um, it seems negative information definitely spreads better than positive. They're yeah, positive. there's an echo chamber at at work. <laughs> um, but you know, this if if the company if we're involved, you know, it doesn't. I don't know. We don't we don't see a lot of negative stuff being posted about us. So, but you know, if there's questions and we are like involved in a d debate after a YouTube review or something, um, <laughs> it's it's amazing how you know it actually kind of it doesn't shut it down. It's it's amazing how it kind of changes very quickly. It's not you know it doesn't end up being sort of a weird trolling negative vibe. It's all of a sudden, oh, well, they get some feedback from the I, company that says, oh, yeah, but, okay, that's why that is, and that makes well, sense. I've also noticed this, and, and you know, like what you're saying, I've noticed this about YouTube where when someone is, you know, upset and they're, they're venting and mm -hmm. they're talking about something that they are displeased with, if someone who is directly re representative of that, because I, I also do a little work in Hollywood, and so someone will complain about like a commercial, like, oh, well, I cast the voice on that, and like the, the whole tone of the conversation changes right. <laughs> immediately after that, like, like, uh oh, I'm not as anonymous on the internet as I thought I was. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, people are much will more willing to, you know, say, um, you know. Uh, screw the police rather than, you know, actually, like... <laughs> Say you know, to the police. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or, your, you know, your your uncle that, you know, is a sheriff or whatever. So, right. Um, I think it's, yeah, I think it's interesting. I just read an article. There was an article in the New York Times, I think, about a study about negative reviews, and a huge portion of them they found actually were written by people that didn't, they hadn't purchased the product. They just they just needed to somehow put 
a negative thing out there. They just needed to go out there for some reason. Well, and, and I also think that that goes into the whole sort of um, juvenile first culture of mm. the internet. Like, I need to be the first person to respond to this blog post, or I need to be the first comment on this review or something like that. And so I, you also notice, that, like, this new thing's come out. I can attract a lot of attention by talking about how it's not going to be good. I haven't yeah. even used it yet, but I want to be one of the first people that people find on the internet hmm. trashing this particular piece of gear or accessory or something like that. And yeah, that's something it's, I've never it's not really a phenomenon I totally understand. <laughs> I don't. I don't get it. I don't understand why that kind of attention appeals to some people. Well, I guess it's the same with trolling on, you know, discussions and wanting to just upset people, you know. Right. Just want to, you know, get people, egg people on and <laughs> get the tomatoes flying or something. So enough about negative stuff. Uh, <laughs> we, 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 uh, because uh, you, you've been, you've been so generous with your time. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, we've got the Galaxy S4 out. We've, mm -hmm. you've, you've released a case for the Note 2. What else is coming down the pipe? What, uh, what is, uh, what are you guys excited about for getting out the door and what can people be looking forward to in the future? Sure. Um, well, we just launched MacBook covers, and those are awesome. I wish I had a new MacBook I could show you. Um, but those... those People, you've got to buy a bunch of Toast covers so that Matthias can get himself a new MacBook. <laughs> yeah, yeah the, the MacBook I'm working on is, is, I think it's six years old. That's why we're struggling with all the technical issues. Um, <laughs> But um, it's, so I'm really excited about those. Um, we are. I think we talked about the HTC One on the video when you interviewed me at um, at at CTIA, didn't you? Yes. Do a little brief. So that's that's on my desk. We're we're working on it. Um, I'm excited to get a cover on there for sure. We get a lot of requests, so that's that's exciting. I think. Okay. If, can 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 you talk about the HTC One cover? Um. Is, it, is or is it not quite ready yet? I have, I have one very specific question about, because I've had a problem with HTC One cases, and it's okay, well, how the case... My, the one I have here, and so I can yes. look at it while you're referencing it. Um, I, so, I don't have a cover on it, I just have the, the, the phone here. But It's a nice phone, right? I was mm -hmm. really impressed with HTC's build on this. But I've had issues with, um, more so with some of the more rugged cases that I've used on the HTC One, in how the case treats the speaker grills. And I'm wondering what you guys mm -hmm. might be considering for guarding the front face of the phone, because that's where I'm most afraid of, you know, because you know, it, it's invariable. The screen will probably get scratched. I'm going to put a screen protector on it. Okay. But what to do about those aluminum vents has sort of been vexing some other case manufacturers. Hmm, yeah. Um, well, what we've done on, like, the iPad covers, um, we did some pretty, you know, we did our own kind of pattern over the holes. Um, that's got a very, you know, that Apple um, speaker ports on that. And we just kind of did an interesting pattern that, you know, um, I mean, it's probably easier for me to show you than the time. Oh, fantastic. You know, um, so, let's see. Oh, that's yeah, cool. So, so we, we did something that's got sort of a bit of an aesthetic quality, but it still kind of is, uh, you know, structurally there. You know, it's not just a big opening. Um, right. No, that so looks great. You, my guess is uh, we'll probably do something similar to that. Um, if we do wrap on the front, honestly, a lot of, you know, up until now we haven't gotten in in on the fronts of the phones. Um, we do have fronts that we're working on, but I've always felt that it kind of got in the way. Um, and it also kind of starts to the aesthetics of the phone. I mean, starting right. with the iPhone, you know, which was, you know, as I said, is such a beautiful product. I actually never wanted to fully disguise it, like turn it into something it's not. I, right. From the beginning, it was always about enhancing the phone and saying, well, this, you know, I'm, I'm not disguising that as an iPhone. I'm not putting in this giant brick that all of a sudden makes it look like a Palm Pilot from, you know, the 90s. <laughs> right. Um, it, you know, it's still an iPhone. It's still recognizable that the, um, the part you interact with is still the same. So, you know, we'll see what we come up with or the solution on the HTC One. Um, but, you know, because we have that material break with the metal, we definitely could 
Um, I'm just always wary of like getting anything that might get in the way of your interaction with the touch screen. Right. Um, and you know you have the the buttons on the bottom of the screen. So we'll kind of see. You know, it's about functionality for us as much as aesthetics, um, and getting that right interaction and the right way to show off the phone without hiding it too much. Right. <laughs> If that well, makes sense. But, but I'm excited to see you guys considering the HTC One. And I know uh, Samsung usually occupies far and away uh, most of the discussion on uh, Android devices just because mm -hmm. they're the number one manufacturer of Android devices right now. Um, but ha have the have you been getting requests for any of the other devices like the LGs? You said uh, someone rec uh, wanted a custom for the Nexus 4? Yeah, we well, we did the Nexus 4 a while back, and we sell occasionally. We sell those. We kind of make them to order. Um, let's see. You know, we, we get a lot of requests for old phones, you know, so people are like, uh, you know, Galaxy S2 or iPhone <laughs> 3G, you know. So um, we get a lot of requests for older phones, and it's sort of hard to tell them, well, you know, we're kind of focusing on the new stuff. <laughs> um, right. That's still being sold, and oh, but um, <laughs> um, now could yeah, someone yeah. approach you about doing, even if it were a more expensive, you know, one-off about doing something like that for one of those older devices? Well, a lot of the older phones actually had such complex geometry to them. You know, they had the molded backs with like bump outs for the the cameras and all kinds of like contours. And so they really didn't lend themselves well to our products or our manufacturing process. Um, it's nice to see them going to much more ge geometry-based aesthetics. So even the S4 compared to the S3. Yeah, the, S, the um, S4's back is so much more simple than... I remember the S2 yeah. had a weird chin bulge down at the bottom of the phone. Mm -hmm. And the Note 2 is pretty, you know, is, is quite... It's not quite as geometrical as the S4, but... You know they're they're getting to back to kind of older fashioned geometry, and the HTC One as well is really like you can draw the the geometrical lines that this phone is based on, which is cool. You know rather than the the completely amorphous soap bar um, stuff that you know we started with, um, but it just makes our job a little bit easier. Um, you know, I, actually, I have a question for you. I'm kind of oh. curious because, um, I don't know, maybe your perception about Android phone owners versus iPhone owners. I mean, not not in the, like, battle royale kind of way, but, you know, it's, <laughs> right. it seems to, you know, attract a different market in the... Um, and I think a lot of case manufacturers are struggling with that, where they find that, you know, if they started in the iPhone arena... Mm -hmm. and then they jumped into Android, um, that often the sales just aren't there the same way. And it's maybe, you know, is it that the customers have a different, you know, they're not looking to change their phone out every season, you know, their, their, you know the aesthetics of their case? or You know what I think is idea? interesting about Android versus iPhone, like specifically, you know, uh, the iPhone is... Um, I think there is a greater desire to customize the iPhone because of how mm -hmm. successful it is. I think mm -hmm. that because there are so many iPhones and they all look very similar, like by the time you get to the iPhone 4, to the 4S, to the 5, and I'm assuming that the 5S is going to have a very similar shell as well, right. that people want to have this premier smartphone, but mm -hmm. they still don't want it to look like every other smartphone out on the market. Whereas, it's almost become generic, right? You know, it's so ubiquitous, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and, like, I don't even want to use the word, like, generic, because I really do love Apple design, even though I'm more of a, an I Android and Windows phone user myself, personally. But I think because no one can point to one droid dominating mm -hmm. the market, and even Samsung sort of wages war at every screen size, you know, so you can have a Galaxy S4 Mini, a Galaxy S4, a Galaxy Note 2, the Galaxy Mega. You know, right. you have all these different devices, and all of those different devices already come in different colors that I think when someone is walking out the door from, you know, like an AT&T store or a Best Buy or a Radio Shack with an iPhone, they'll already have some customization in mind. Mm -hmm. With the Android, the Android itself is already a customization, you know, it's, it's already something a little bit more unique, just a little bit different, um, right. and it's less likely that someone in their social circle will have the exact same phone as them. Mm -hmm. And then, typically, I think, 
people go out to buy Android cases more for the practicality of protection first. Right. Before they're considering, you know, uh, aesthetics. So, you know, you might see like an OtterBox case or something like that. I see a lot of those, especially on the Galaxy Note, which is already a huge device. And then they put this giant case on it. But then you think like, yeah, that's a, an enormous phone. You probably want to protect it because it's so much glass and so mm -hmm. much plastic that it could break pretty easily if you were to drop it. Well, and things are so valuable. I mean, I won't poo-poo people wanting to protect these expensive objects, you know, that house so much of their information Oh yeah, they're they're our first yeah. our, our our first uh, go to device now for almost any piece of communication that comes our way. Absolutely, it's a, it's, it's fascinating psychology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting to think that yeah, you, there's the Android marketplace is so broad that you feel like you can still go in and buy something that fits your personality, and so the object itself still feels somewhat personable um, versus buying. Yeah, the ubiquitous iPhone. But I also think that's why some of our some of our sales tastes will change over time. Um, you know, mm -hmm. it's funny listening to people criticize the Galaxy S4, which I think is a very attractive phone, but they're criticizing it for the same reason why we might criticize an iPhone. Like it didn't stray enough from mm -hmm. the Galaxy S3 design. So now few people feel like, well, if I buy the Galaxy S4, people might not be able to tell that I spent more money on the newer, more exciting phone right. than the Galaxy S3, which looks very similar. And then we see HTC do something very bold with their aluminum HTC mm -hmm. One, and that's selling really well. It's not going to unseat the Galaxy S4 by any stretch of the imagination, but it's one of the more popular HTC phones we've had. So again, it's like you, you get that sort of like hipster cred, you mm -hmm. know, <laughs> with like Android and Windows phone devices. Like I just, I want people to know that I spent a lot of money on my phone and I want people to know that my phone is different than their phone. <laughs> right. In some way. Interesting. Yeah. Perceptual differences. Yeah. Cool. Well, Matisse, uh, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us. Uh, where can people find more information on your company, your products, uh, maybe engage with some social discussion with you if they choose to? Sure, sure. So the website is toastmade.com. That's T-O-A-S-T-M-A-D-E.com. Um, and that's got a lot about us and all the product ranges and stuff like that. And we're really active on Instagram and Facebook, um, at Toastmade, um, for either of those, and uh, Twitter as well. So, um, yeah, all Toastmade, you can find us. Um, and, uh, yeah, we, we, you know, we really try to interact. So, you know, on Facebook we'll post up you know, some new designs we're considering, let people vote for things. Um, we do a lot of seasonal stuff, you know, for holidays. So people get to interact, get to influence the products that we're creating. Um, and we do a lot of custom stuff. So I like to point that out, that on our website you can get your name engraved. So a lot of just people like to put their marks. So just putting your name or favorite quote on, you know, on a cover is kind of a fun thing um, that people can do. And then we do full custom ones where people supply their artwork and, and we do oh, full-on custom covers. So, um, and we, you know, we because we're manufacturing in-house, everything's turned around in one to three days. So, you know, you can get your full custom wood cover really quick, and you know, get it right on your phone. So, yeah, I really appreciate talking with you again, Juan. Um, Definitely. Well, and, and like I said, you were such a happy find for us at CTIA because we were kind of bummed out. <laughs> you know, like, I wish there was more exciting stuff to talk about this year at CTIA. <laughs> and then we stumbled on your booth and it was a happy find. Uh, for, uh, as, as a quick plug for folks on yourtechreport.com, uh, Matias was uh, kind enough to send us two iPhone 5 covers, which we're going to be giving away later on the site. There will be more details on yourtechreport.com, so check back in with us for those. And uh, in the meantime, go check out uh, toastmade.com for more info on some really interesting, unique, fashionable covers for your smartphones, tablets, and now MacBooks. Uh, for those of you wanting to better protect your devices while you're out and about with something that's a little more unique and something that feels really good in the hand. Uh, Matias, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. And uh, folks, we'll catch you all on the next video.